Hey, Greg, thanks so much for joining me today on the Financial Planner Life podcast. How are you, my man? I'm really good. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, good to be here. How are you doing? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thank you. Um, you got obviously tagged in one of my posts by a mutual friend to say, get him on the podcast. He needs to get out there. So here we are today recording one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I can blame him if it goes spectacularly wrong and I make an absolute fool of myself. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's a, no, he's, a, he's a good guy. Yeah, he's a, he's a non-financial planner that I spent a lot of time talking about um, financial planning with, uh, Jay. Yeah. So he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's a good chap and we talk about a lot of uh, sad work-related stuff and he thought it'd be quite good to get, uh, to get involved in this sort of thing. So well, um, his background's law, isn't it? Yeah, he's a legal engineer now. So he's, uh, yeah, I worked with him at a, at a law firm where I, I practiced uh, for a few years as, yeah. a, as, a, as, a, as a non-lawyer, as a financial planner. Um, so we did a lot of work together on kind of client related stuff. But yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's one of those annoying guys that's just good at too many things, you know. So he's, uh, he's a kind of brilliant lawyer plus like a brilliant technologist. So he's kind of moved more into that. And he's, uh, he's writing code for a law firm, I think. Uh, at the moment. But, uh, so he's moving, yeah. in, moving into the tech side of law. Now, I know him through his sister because... I was at the same school as his sister and we had a bit of a relationship. Oh, so interesting. I wonder if he remembers that. Eh? We, we need to. Perhaps if, he's listen, perhaps if he's listening to this now, he'll, re he'll, he'll remember. <laughs> Complicated subplot there, isn't there? We need a, yeah. a, di a, a diagram to understand how this all fits together. <laughs> and it's kind of like, it's like an EastEnders episode, this podcast today. We're going to have to. It is. It is isn't it? I, think, I was thinking more Hollyoaks, actually, but yeah, no, EastEnders oh, yeah. works too. Yeah. <laughs> That's surname, anyway, Oaks, isn't it? Absolutely. Right. So, Greg, thank you so much for joining me today. As I said, um, really great to have you on the podcast. I've obviously known you for, for quite some time. And when I very first got into recruitment, I placed you, didn't I, um, into a role with Towery uh, about 11, 12, 12 years ago, I reckon. I, when know, I, hate, when, I hate when you say things like that because it makes me realise how, yeah. how long I've been knocking around the industry and how old I am. But uh, yeah, yeah, time flies, doesn't it, when you're having fun? Um, no, I yeah. remember it. Yeah, remember it well. And uh, yeah. Obviously, you would recommend my services to everybody you speak to, surely. Absolutely. Yeah, everybody I meet just, you know, yeah. <laughs> there we go. What's my testimony have done? I'll stop recording now. I'll just release that on, on LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I'm just queues at the post office, just people in the street, you know, whatever. Just, cool. uh, yeah, yeah, you need to speak to this guy. Brilliant. <laughs> Okay, great stuff. So today, really, I want to get into the podcast because I know that you've gone through down, you've gone down through the employed route, if you like, within financial planning, and mm. um, you've stepped outside of employed, and you've now set up your own business, which is eleven point two. Yeah? yeah, and um, you know, I really always like to talk to financial planners that have gone alone, basically, and set up their own businesses mm. because a, I think it's a really brave thing to do anyway, running your own business. Um, but I always like to understand why, what got you to that decision and, um, you know, the experiences you've had so far in, in, in like running your own practice, you know, is, is it as you planned it and being a business owner myself and fully aware of the multiple hats you have to wear when running mm. a practice and running a business, it's, um, it's never as easy as you think it is. And I'm very keen to understand your experience. It's a very much an area of um, recruitment that I specialize in, which is the self-employed area. I really enjoy it actually, because there are so many levels to it. It's not as simple as placing somebody in an employed role. It's, it's very, very different. Um, so yeah, just to kick things off though, uh, Greg, what would be really fantastic is just, could you give us an overview of just how you got into the profession and maybe a, a quick sort of brief uh, overview of your, um, your career to date? It would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, well, if, if a uh, point of order, first of all, uh, you, you, you say, you know, brave uh, um, going into self employment. It took me 20 years to do it, right? So, uh, right. <laughs> so I, I'm absolutely, a, a, I feel like a bit of a chicken, you know. I, I sort of um, speak to some young guys who were just entering the industry and, you know, do, do a bit of mentoring. And, you know, a lot of these guys are just bang up for going straight into self employed roles and mm. you know, run, running their own thing. And, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it always makes me feel a little bit ashamed of myself for taking. 20 years to, to, to take the plunge but I got there in the end um so I mean in terms of my, my work history um I yeah I've, I've been uh, scarily I've, I've been around for almost exactly 20 years now I, I realized when I was I was working it out um and I started life uh in a a national IFA which I chose to be down in Bath um I joined that very rare thing um a, a grad scheme there uh, and I kind of fell into it because I had absolutely to be absolutely no idea what what financial advice was financial planning wasn't really a thing then it was a very different sort of industry um but I thought well, this sounds interesting you know I, I sort of remember reading the spec and thinking you know it's lots of you know helping 
people solve problems and <clears throat> um, you know they made it sound sound interesting so I was I was intrigued but I was going for all sorts of jobs at that point so I could have done something completely different um, but uh, but I joined there and I was I was glad I did I got some really really good training off some really good guys um, I mean one thing you know that that long ago the industry was a completely different place so you know far less emphasis I guess on on technical knowledge and, and training and you know formal training particularly through Sierra PFS um, you know some people uh, had um, what are, you know advanced certificates and you know sort of um, pension transfer qualifications but it was rare you know um, they were kind of uh, yeah, yeah they, they sort of stood out um, and um, obviously that's all, all changed now in, in really good ways um, but what they were really good at and I think what what the industry <clears throat> was really good at generally then was um uh, it was all the soft skills training so you know you join and you know, you're, you're hot housed a bit i think places like that so you're kind of you know you're straight into face-to-face -face client meetings very very early in your kind of development which is uh kind of terrifying um potentially dangerous but also quite beneficial if, if it works out for you um because you know you just you, you're just forced to, to learn all those those soft skills quite uh, quite quickly Mm. to sort of survive in that role um uh, and i think it's i think it's changed I, th I think you know these days it takes a lot longer to kind of get in front of clients and uh, i think some firms have gone kind of the other way actually you know in terms of you know young kind of ambitious graduates join and you know they, they don't get that kind of experience for quite a long time so this mm. was probably probably a happy medium but it was very much the, the opposite back then so i spent a few years <clears throat> um there um and, and had a good time um i left to do something a bit different i worked in in marketing agencies for a couple of years and, and did a master's in that and uh you know, i just wanted some more some more business qualifications which which have sort of helped me since um because it's all it's all relevant but um i was lured back to to financial advice after a couple of years uh, of, of that and I've, I've sort of I've, I've stayed here ever since okay um, okay so when you was, you said you mentioned there sort of back in the day you were sort of thrown into financial planning then so not so much that academy approach or that power planner route into becoming a financial advisor it no. was straight in here's some here's some clients get stuck into it was this pre-RDR or just Pre, yeah, you're, you're, you're deliberately trying to make me feel old, feel old now, aren't you? But it's okay. I, 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 it's all, I'm noting it all. You're one of those um, old financial advisors I we really, read about in the we, newspapers. Listen, listen we, we agreed the other day. I'm still I'm still a young financial advisor. Right? Yes. And, <laughs> only because financial advisors are so old. Yeah. Um, it's, all, it's all relative. Yeah. Um, but, but but yeah yeah. I, so this this yeah this was this was pre RDR way before before RDR. So um, the the kind of qualification benchmarks were, were, were much lower you know the, yeah. the, the um fewer hurdles really i mean in fact you know my i remember you know it, it was uh, you had to get through your fpc um so you know in, in, in old money i think it was three papers wasn't it and um you know sort of certificate level stuff so you know you kind of got on with those very very early so i'd be there sitting, sort of sitting F, fpc one and two um within the first couple of weeks and you know not really knowing what an iso was and you know not long after that you kind of qualified to go and see clients deal with their kind of uh, complex needs it's um so um so, so yeah no it, it, this this was pretty uh, pretty RDR, but but you know the thing about back then was you know that it wasn't it wasn't the wild west completely there were still really really good advisors that did yeah. all these papers because they wanted to you know um and they wanted to be to be good and actually you know I, I was very lucky to be you know to work under some some really really good guys um back back in those days that, that you right. know, sort of, you know, cool to, so that sort of cutting your teeth quite early on though you know being thrown into the deep end yeah. um it, it taught you a thing or two about financial planning and financial advice because you mentioned you were at Chase Devere was that mm. like in the because Chase Devere used to were well, kind of one of the early adopters really of having um like phone-based advisors as well yep, you, that's, was that what you were doing yep that's where I started yep so that was that was yeah. a kind of that was sort of the training ground I guess so you know we yeah. we, we, we advised and it's interesting because we advised sort of solely over the phone and, and email and, and and stuff um and you know it was kind of I mean they, they used it then I don't know how it operates now but it was it was sort of you know a training ground for guys mm. who joined the industry without much kind of knowledge of, of things and learned the ropes and then you got to, you got you became a face-to-face -face advisor once you'd sort of proved yourself and you could you know so I, I think within about a year I'd, I'd, I'd done that and then I spent the rest of my time there kind of on the road as yeah. a face-to-face -face advisor um, but yeah you look back and you think actually that was pretty forward thinking and, and mm. um, I mean a funny thing is you know bearing in mind that was that was all those decades ago um, actually you know during lockdown um, it, it served me well you know because you know been, ha having to kind of do all your business uh, via, well, we didn't have Zoom back then because it wasn't invented. Yeah. I think I think the internet was, but yeah, um, I, I don't think there was such a thing as Zoom. Um, 
but but you know just having to sort of take on new clients you know sort of purely via kind of phone and email and, and entirely remotely um it's not new you know because I've, I've done it since 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 back then so yeah um you know you look back and you think actually it's quite a forward thinking kind of way of, of of operating and i think you learn some good skills then as well don't you because yep. you know it's amazing what you what you can do remotely um and i sort of tend to think now that you're actually quite spoiled if you can get in front of, of clients and have all the kind of non verbal stuff and you know it, you obviously have much richer meetings if you're forced to not have all that sort of stuff you have to work a bit harder i think to um to have good meetings but no absolutely I, and i i'm sort of all for these telephone based financial advice propositions because i mean you've got tilney that that, that have got one um i know chase devere is still kind of operating in that space and a few others have started to grow these telephone based propositions and um you're absolutely right it's a really good ground for someone to get into because you get to speak to you get exposure and you get to speak to so many clients and um because you're phone based, you've got that kind of supervisor with you at all time. So when you have a question or you can prepare for a call, you've got someone next to you or someone within the team who's probably done it before. And yeah. it's a lot quicker and easier to get you through the processes of, of understanding the, uh, the process, if you like, of effective financial planning around a specific product type, perhaps, or a specific type of client that you're dealing with. Um, and also what I found with those telephone bases ones as well is that they are more willing to take somebody on that's got the level four qualification and perhaps some experience off of uh, marketing or something like that or coming from an account manager role um, and more inclined to really, really take somebody in. And what you find is that they spend a couple of years in that zone, don't they? And then naturally progress into um, a face to face financial planner. So I'd like to see more of those, really, because I think that's a really great way to get more people into the profession. Um, and to give them that grounding, because um, as you rightfully said, you know, administration to power planner to financial planner, that's your typical route. And it tends to be the typical route for anybody coming in who's not got any experience. So perhaps a grad, perhaps someone in the early stages of their, of, you know, in the early part of their 20s, for example. Um, I'm not sort of poo-pooing that route at all, because I think the route itself lends uh, a kind of uh, cr cruel, you know, walk before you run type approach uh, to financial planning. But I think it can also be a disadvantage that kind of natural kind of progressive route to anybody that wants to step across from a profession where perhaps they might have been earning some considerable money but now want to step into financial planning and they've got all the skills and all the attributes but want to step straight into the role of financial planner perhaps they've got really good clients perhaps they've got a really good network of introducers already in place they just want to leverage off of yeah um, and that's where you've then got that barrier to entry that's happening but it's getting kind of better i suppose you know st james's place and quilter with all these academies but it's very kind of like that's the route and that's the only route if you haven't got any actual experience of financial advice whereas um i think if the only way this advisor gap gap is going to get smaller is mm. if firms are willing to take on people straight into financial advice positions that have got the skill sets and the attributes that are transferable yeah. so um yeah, I like that. I do like that telephone based stuff. Great. So you've had a good experience within within sort of financial planning. What's really interesting is that whilst you, when you got into the profession, you thought I'm going to leave and I'm going to go and do something completely different. <laughs> so what? Why was that? What was the what was the reason for that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I guess like I suppose a lot of people who kind of go into financial advice roles, I fell into it. I didn't really know what a financial advisor was, you know, bef you know, before I got my first job in it and for, for a while afterwards as well. Um, so I kind of, you know, I had this sense that, that I hadn't kind of come to it as a sort of positive decision almost. Uh, you know, it, it was something that I wasn't quite clear about what the other options were. Um, mm. And I did a humanities degree. So, you know, sort of, you know, not not some economics but not all that relevant so i was quite keen to um to get some some business qualifications as well which you know sort of served me quite well since so um i uh, yeah so i left there after after a few years just thinking i'd, I'd try some other stuff and mm. add some strings to my bow so i did my um uh, my master's at bristol business school um and that was that was good and um uh, it was mainly uh, a marketing based qualification so i kind of got interested in that and, and spent a few years in, in marketing agencies and i really enjoyed it actually it was really good um i guess what i missed i missed all the kind of direct with client stuff you know so mm. working in a, a marketing function you know you're working on some really interesting strategic stuff behind the scenes but you're a few steps away from the actual end user and um what i think is you know i, I kind of figured out in that role that I, i'd really liked about about financial advice was you know you, you are in front of people um um you know dealing with sort of wants and needs directly and um you know but you can also use some of that sort of strategic marketing 
um, kind of know-how um, uh, in your role as well, but but also you're sort of you know you're you're there at the I guess the sharp end, you know, to use to use the cliche. And I sort of find um, I find I, I enjoy it, and I sort of realised when I wasn't doing it anymore that I missed it and that I, that I had enjoyed it. So so yeah, I went back and um, uh, and I was glad I did, you know, because I th I think uh, and I was glad I took a break from it as well because I think without that I think I wouldn't have really had to to mm. think much about what I liked about it and why I wanted to do it, you know, and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I know some people just fall into a career and they just keep doing it because it pays the bills and works yeah. okay for them. But I like to feel sort of, you know, driven. I like to feel like I know why I'm doing something and what, yeah. what, what the point of it is, you know, and why it, um, you know, why, why, why it sort of uh, fits in with, with how I want to, to, to um, you know, to, to, to well, when you've been so used to a client facing role and a relationship building role, you kind of when that's the only thing that you ever know it's like when I was younger I did sales and it was like the only thing I ever knew I know I mm. lost out of school and the only thing you could really go and do is work in sales mm. I used to knock on people's doors at like 17 years old trying to get them to change over their 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 um electrical <laughs> providers I, you know I cut my teeth in some really sort of salesy types positions so I always oh, had a negative odds. yeah I had a really negative view I guess of what sales was it was cold yeah. calling it was horrible you know yeah um, and I, and I kind of like, um, stepped away from that and then moved into like customer service. Yeah. And I loved customer service because it's that real customer experience, enhancing mm. the customer experience, solving problems, you know, understanding what their, their worries were, their concerns and really kind of solving the problem, but also being that balance between, you know, your being, your expectations are too high or your, 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 your thought process is completely out of whack. And actually you need to look at it from this perspective. So I think customer service, for example, was a really um, interesting area to get into because it showed me the other side of sales, mm, you know, yeah. sales and customer service. And then I worked in an area which was very process driven and, and the administration and managing a team around that. And then you could see the marrying it all together. So I think sometimes you have to kind of, your first, what you think is you, the only thing you know, you have to step outside of it and learn some other skills or see things from another perspective to see what part you actually really like. And like you, I really enjoy relationships. Mm. You know, I like to build a relationship with somebody. I like to understand their ups, their downs, what makes them tick and try to solve a problem for them. And that's very much, isn't it, what financial planning Mm. is now it's it's very relationship driven and obviously you've got that marketing experience touching on that mm. do you think there's lots of transferable skills from marketing that work incredibly well within the financial planning profession yeah i, I do um actually you know and i i think um i think a lot of it is 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 to do with psychology you know i think i think you know it, it's it's just a, it's just a question of of the sort of scale you know I, I think when you're trying to sort of run a marketing campaign and figure out um you know a marketing strategy for for a business you're 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 sort of thinking about you know the the, the end user experience and just trying to multiply that across people and and uh, come up with a, a way that works <clears throat> and i think you know in in your dealings with individual clients as an advisor or as you know as, as any other professional you're you're trying to solve those individual problems and see where and I think also when you sort of you know when you're new business focused and you're sort of pitching to new um, stuff which you know I've, I've tended to be when I was employed and I still am now as a, as a self-employed guy um, you're, you're always sort of having to think about you know where the value is for these clients mm. right you know so you know because you're always having these conversations where they're they're trying to figure out whether to engage you and there's a cost for, for that um but but there's also you know you're delivering value for that cost and um and i think particularly in financial advice uh people seem to grapple with that more um uh, i'm not sure i'm not sure why but um you know I, I guess because you've got the diy route which perhaps you maybe don't have so it which i think is, is fine you know got all these different approaches that, that exist um, so I'm, I'm quite used to having these conversations with people just just very honestly and transparently about okay well here here are the different things you can do um, and if you want to go with us here's where we think we can deliver value for you for our costs um, and you know it all comes down to marketing doesn't it it's like that mm. you know that, that that perception of value and you know you how you as a business demonstrate before you've actually engaged the client that you're able to add that value and then you know keep demonstrating it um so you know i think you're spot on you know i think i think it's relevant and and i guess now as a um you know as a business owner like you said earlier you've got all these hats haven't you so um you know i'm i'm doing the marketing um in a sort of more formal sense as, mm. as well as the kind of direct with client stuff and the advice so i can see how it all fits together yeah um, cool. 
Well, leading up to that then, so obviously you had a career, you've had a, you know, a career where you've worked in financial planning, you then left, did marketing, got your head around that, decided that you want to go back to financial planning, financial advice, back into an employed area, worked your way through there. But then you came to a point, you came to a decision where you thought, I don't want to work for anybody else anymore. Yeah. How did you come to the decision that you wanted to go self-employed? I mean, it, it took me a while, I, I guess. I wish I'd done it earlier in, in a lot of ways, but then, you know, um, it's, um, I'm, I'm glad I got, I'm glad, I'm glad I got here in the end. Um, I mean, for, for me, it was, it was a sort of gradual thing, you know, I mean, I, I've been very lucky to, to work for some really great firms with some really, really great people over the years. Um, and, you know, and I was, I was, I was happy in a lot of those roles. Um, I, I think as I sort of developed and, and kind of acquired more experience and started to think a bit more, um, generally about you know how to um, how, how to do the job and, and and you know all the stuff that goes around the job as well and how that should be done. I think what I started to realise that I was kind of in in these these big firms um, that are you know there's a lot of established ways of doing things, a lot of legacy issues, and actually a lot of the a lot of the problems out there in the industry and a lot of the the things I was interested in looking at how to solve uh, they evolve very quickly and and um, I think they need new approaches to to deal with them <clears throat> and, and what I sort of started to realize gradually was that it's actually very hard to respond to those um, quickly enough and, and in the right way and flexibly enough in in a big firm where you're just one voice and there's all this other stuff to, to fight against which often doesn't make sense you know what it's like in big firms you know there's a process and uh, everyone knows it's not the right process but Dave came up with it and he'll be really offended if you change the process yeah. so um it's uh so, so you know and which, which is fine you know that, that that's all part of the, the rich tapestry of working for big organizations um, but you know, when I started to kind of think about actually, you know, what what do I want to do? What what kind of really gets me out of bed in the mornings? And it's it's this kind of interesting emerging areas of advice, like how do you close the advice gap? You know, broaden the market for financial advice to to younger people, to people who might not ordinarily engage a financial advisor who look different from your typical client of a financial advice firm. Things like ESG investing, you know, it's all very, you know, requires. I think quite a lot of flexibility of thought around how it fits in with your investment proposition and all that stuff. And what I was kind of realizing is, is that in order to really do a, a proper job of tackling these, you just need to be quite nimble and you need to be quite, you know, able to be very forward thinking. Uh, and it's a heck of a lot easier when you're in a, you know, your own small organization where you can, you can control the direction of travel a lot more easily. So, you know, that's what sort of finally pushed me into the decision to do it was just, I guess, wanting to make an impact in some of those areas that I was getting more interested in and feeling like I was, I guess, you know, limited my ability to sort of, to, to make a good go of it elsewhere. I think, yeah, spot on. Um, I think a lot of people find that in the traditional financial planning firms, um, especially where they have the processes in place that have been there for years you know, the appetite to perhaps change or develop the, even the, the clients that you're actually targeting and what you're going after and having the foresight to see that these individuals are going to need financial planning. And perhaps we need to change our approach to how we communicate um, or even things, simple things like adopting a really interesting or engaging digital marketing strategy, going after certain clients that you wouldn't typically consider would be a client of that firm. And I think um, there's a lot of people that are sitting there seeing the changes that are happening around them and financial planning with a lot of firms is just stagnating. You know, their whole kind of ethos, their outlook, you know, even their branding, it's just so dated, you know, it's like something from the bloody eighties. And you think to yourself, yeah. yeah, how are you even winning clients? And you, mm. then you get to the crux of it that, you know, a lot of these people are a lot older, you know, and, and this is me being ageist here, but the average age of a financial advisor is 56 years old. Their clients are pretty damn old. Mm. They're not after new clients as such, you know, they they are in that wealth management space where they're looking after people that have got money, you know, mm. minimum 50k investable assets, and they're not too concerned about the next gen. Why should they be when their business model isn't about that? Mm. Um, but it leaves a great gap, as you be rightfully you pointed out, the advice gap, you know, this great big gap of individuals, clients that are out there that need servicing by a financial planner, but. A, they need to find that financial planner. And the way they do it is through searching on Google, Instagram, TikTok. You know, I was chatting to a financial planner today about TikTok. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are all these different platforms when you can get your message across and win that client through relationships. And 
the next gen, not even the next gen, our generation, we like you and I are both like, I'm 40 this year. You know, we, we try before we buy, we look online, we look at a, a, a company before we even make a decision to, in, to engage with that company. Yeah. You know, we're, we're doing a beauty parade ourselves on our mobile phones on the way to work. Yeah. You know? and we're, building, we're building trust and we're building relationships with people before we even pick the phone up. And um, I think if you're not doing that within financial planning, you're being left behind. And one of the best ways you can do that is to work on your personal brand and be a master of your own destiny and set up your own company because you choose the direction of where it goes. Do you find as well that, do you know what I love about being a business owner? I know it's recruitment, but I just love the fact that I can do what I want. Yeah, yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't have to tell anybody. No, one, I'm, I sometimes it's, it's hard because you don't have anybody patting you on the back, and you don't have anybody sort of you know almost guiding you or coaching you to where you need to go. Yeah. So it can be quite difficult sometimes and quite lonely. Mm. Um, but there is something beautiful about getting up in the morning and you don't have to answer to anybody. Except yeah. Me. Half the wife, but I, I, always, always that caveat. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. But you know what? I bet, I bet you do get up, and I bet, I bet, I bet you put, a, you know, a lot of hours in because it, it's, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, this is what I found is that in the last, because about a year we've been up and running, um, and I've, I, you know, it's been the, you know, the, probably the hardest working year that that, that I've, I've got in my, not that, you know, not that I didn't work hard before. I, I hasten to add, but, but yeah. you know, I, I, I guess you have that secret fear, don't you, that when you set up on your own and nobody's sort of, you know measuring your output and telling you what to do that i don't know you know maybe, maybe you won't do it you don't know i guess do you in advance you know i suppose you don't know what that that kind of what your self-motivation looks like in that completely different environment but but now absolutely i'm sure it's the same for you you know i um i'm more energized and motivated and you sort of think why i mean it, it, it it's because i've got control over some of those things that I previously didn't you know I, I have the ability to now you know to try and speak as a business with, with a with a tone of voice that appeals to you know some of these investors these these potential clients that are just put off by all the, the trappings of, of the mm. traditional advice industry um, and I'm really passionate about that you know so it's, it's really it's really great and also I've got this direct line to the clients now you know I can I can change process processes for them you know I can listen to to their concerns about what they don't like about things we've done for them for, for 10 years at, at different firms and and make changes and you know and of course it's been a year where where clients have had a lot of you know a lot of need for support so I've spent a lot of time kind of um, having those conversations with them and, and and that's massively motivating isn't it because yeah. you know you want to do it just because not because somebody's sending a TCF questionnaire to a client mm. to make sure that they're happy or, or you know because you you know you want referrals off them or you want to hang on to their business because you've got targets to hit you know you do it because you know they you've looked after them for a long time and they're great guys and you want to help them carry on being successful and you um, want, you want <clears> them, it's not so much you want them to like you we do mm. I guess you but you want them to trust you and you want them I'm to really trust. needy as well absolutely I wasn't I wasn't hugged enough as a child that's the my ways my 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 <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> pretty much yeah pretty much why people just run their own businesses control freaks I think needy control freaks i think that's that's it isn't it pretty much yeah, I've, yeah. De I've definitely gone through that stage <laughs> and that doesn't when you grow a business and you start employing people and then that's the weird one right it was when you start growing a business employing people then you expect people to do what you do and obviously you can't expect you know people are people they're their own mm. they, they think the way they want to think you can guide them and coach them but if you lack the ability to do that like i had i was a nightmare for years i was just like why are they doing it that way why are they doing it, they gotta do it my way and yeah. um did me absolutely no favors and the day i let go and just sort of said well you do what you want and as long as within the com as long as it's within the framework of this you you treat it like your own business the day i did that then oh my god the weight off my shoulders i was just like oh right actually this is okay you know yeah i don't need to know the ins and outs of what you're doing and be worried about wrecking my reputation because you're not a dipstick and i don't hire dipsticks anymore yeah. anymore <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it's, it's it's true, isn't it? You know, I think if you're kind of very, if you're very exacting about you what you want and you want kind of real excellence in the firm, then it's it's quite a hard thing to. You know, I can see that we're very small now, but as we grow, you know, making sure that people kind of get that, and and perhaps there'll be people who don't get it to the same degree that you do. And um, it's um, no, it, it's tough, but at the same time, I really, really want to to, to be, you know, a proper uh, a delegator. You know, give people because mm. I've, I've been on the other side of it as an employee, and you know, I don't want to stifle people. I want them to feel like they can you know really bring their a game and work on 
you know areas of work that that, that, that kind of get them really energized um it's, that's one it's, of the that is one of the positives about being employed for so long is that you do have that experience of being on the other fence mm, the other mm. side i think when people jump straight into self-employment and run yeah. their business if they want to do it that's where it becomes tricky because you haven't mm. dedicated you haven't dealt you haven't spent enough time with other employees and maybe managed within that space as well so i yeah. think there's certain skill sets you lack when you become a lone wolf mm. too early on um, yeah i think that's the beauty of going into these corporate environments you know when you bring somebody out of like an hsbc's become like a manager or whatever um, and they go in and set their own firm up. Yeah, it's an absolute baptism of fire because they've gone down a mm. bank assurance route into IFA or something like that. And they go, well, that's yeah. completely different. But they have so many skills that they've learned from the employed background um, that are so transferable that set them up, up against somebody who's just jumped two footed into being self-employed. Yeah. So, um, so when you set up, so when you made the decision to be going, become self-employed, how did you go about doing it then? So if someone's listening to this, they're employed at the moment, what did you do? Did you pick up the phone to a recruitment consultant? Did you do some, did you do some research online? Um, because as a financial uh, planner going self-employed, there are routes, aren't there? You can be um, directly authorized. You can be a registered individual. You could be an appointed representative. You could join a national or a network or um, you can outsource compliance only. So what did you do then? What was your sort of strategy when you decided, right, I'm going self-employed? What was your first step? It's it, it's hard, isn't it? You're right. There, there, there are so many ways to do it, and, and you sort of realise when you kind of when you start doing your research. Uh, yeah, I guess how how little you know as somebody who's just been really looked after uh, in an employed role. Everything's just sort of happened around you. It's like actually, this is this is a whole other world out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much the, you know, we looked at all the, the, the various options that, that you kind of, you describe and talk to, to mates who've, who've, who've done it before and had some really helpful conversations with some other people, you know, that, that, that were very good in that kind of uncertain zone where we weren't, you know, we knew we wanted to do it, but weren't sure how. Um, and the way that we've approached it is we're, um, we're with a network. So we're with Sense, um, and we're, we're very happy with that. Um, you know, it, it was a bit of, did a lot of due diligence actually on, you know, I think we, we realized that's certainly an easier route, less risky route for getting kind of up and running um, uh, as, as a firm because, you know, you sort of sub out all of your, your, your compliance and they just take care of all that really <laughs> terrifying stuff that, you know, potentially keeps you up at night. And, you know, we, we're, we're, we're you know, super low risk as well. You know, we want to do things sort of in the, 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 the right way and be told how to do it the right way. So, you know, we knew we needed that really robust compliance input from somewhere and I mean I guess you could go directly authorize and buy in that compliance function in some form but I felt like you know having that kind of wrapper of a you know being an AR firm and a good network um, around you um, gave us a lot of comfort and, and they've been great guys you know and it's not just compliance stuff you know a lot of the, the practice management um, of course they they you know they see good practice across a lot of firms so you know this has been some really good input around investment proposition stuff and you know um, our regulatory documents and all those bits and pieces that we we were clueless about um so uh, so yeah we're, we're we're with sense and that works really well and i think the reason it works it works well from our perspective is that um they're, they're very very good at, at all the compliance stuff that, that you know it gives us comfort to be able to sort of know is is is, is in hand um but you know very flexible about kind of practice level stuff um you know as long as they're kind of happy that you're involving them with the right stuff at the right times um you know you're you're sort of pretty free in terms of what markets you're interested in and stuff like that which is you know important based on what we were talking about earlier about having the flexibility to to try and you know go after types of client than, than you might in a traditional firm mm. um and and they're, they're big on you know independence as well um and i've always almost always worked as, a, as an IFA um, um, with a sort of whole of market remit. So it's kind of important to, to hang on to that. I do think that's an important thing to, to keep. Um, so that was that was a big thing as well. So, so yeah, we're, we're an AR firm of, of, of theirs, um, but in terms of you know our marketing strategy and, and, and our clients and what they look like, um, I don't, I'm not sure that would look particularly different, different if we go on the directly authorized route, because you know, they were very clear about you know, bits that, that we, well, the, that they do. As you sort of said, you know, when you start to look at your options, going one of the one things I always say to somebody is, look, you know, you need to build your own brand mm. because it's your baby, and you want to be able to position yourself and your proposition, you know, the way you want to. 
going down the RI route as a registered individual, or even some, yeah, mainly as a registered individual, you will be taking on somebody else's branding mm. and you don't really have any control over that. Mm. And um, I think with the dawn of digital marketing and social media and the way it's going forward is that you need to be in control of your brand. It's your own personal brand, but it's the branding of your company as well. And you need to be able to change it as and when and put content out as and when that reflects the type of clients and market that you're looking to tap into. Mm -hmm. And when you are relying upon another firm, it's very difficult to do that, self-employed or employed, you know? And that's where a lot of the frustrations come. And, you know, late, you know, and that is within financial planning, there are a lot of firms that don't really, don't really engage with digital marketing at all or social media. Um, so I can see the, the guys who are working in those firms feeling very um, stifled it was only recently that St. James's Place even let their partners, um, you know, do their own marketing and, and work on their personal brands. And I remember speaking to loads of those guys and they were stifled, you know, because they were limiting the availability of how to get themselves out there. Yeah. So, yeah, AR is perfect, isn't it? Someone looks after all your compliance. You might be able to tap into a bit of their administration, power plan and support. Not only that, but they've got experience of helping other firms mm. um, and um, can explain and take away a lot of the fears and worries and concerns that you might have. And compliance, I speak to directly authorised firms that are quite small and adamant they wanted to go directly authorised. I mean, all the Gabriel reports, all the stuff that you've got to do, it keeps you does keep you up at night. And I think yeah. you need somebody in your business is purely 100% focused on compliance. I don't think you can be a two-man band or one you know two person one person company directly authorized without sweating a lot you know yeah and it's a yeah. huge huge cost of time and money that, that that's associated to it so fair play to you the route that you've gone down second time i've had someone on from sense network i get a lot of um positive vibes from um uh sense sense um is it sense network isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It is sense, you've got sense yeah. investments as well sense network so yeah. yeah that's very positive good so you know let's talk about your company you set up then so 11.2 yeah yes this yeah. is your new firm so who's in it is it just yourself or is there anybody else uh, myself and my co-director uh kate island who's uh she's a power planner so worked with her cool. in uh previous roles so you know as an advice team we've um you know we've had that kind of uh consistency for clients that we've looked after for the last the last few years which is which is great cool. um and uh yeah we've got some we're sort of in a bit of a recruitment phase at the moment so we've got some uh, probably yeah it's sort of t t tbc um details but we're we're growth orientated so you know we're effectively we're one advice team uh, at the moment okay. um but we're looking to to add advice teams you know with appropriate support and, and add to advisor numbers um this year so um so, so so yeah that's that's our kind of i guess our, our next phase of things 2020 was about getting foundations right you know yep. so just wanted to um you know get the firm set up properly not rush that kind of that initial building phase you know get processes right get all the sort of tech stack right um you know figure out how, how best to do things with you know with, with sense and uh um, make sure all of the kind of existing client following was all sort of looked after properly yeah. and didn't feel sort of left behind by this process. So um, but that's kind of where we've been so far. And we're, we're coming out of that phase into a um, into a new one, I think, where, you know, we're looking a little bit more outside our, you know, the, 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 the firm and looking at kind of growth and Cool. Okay. Great. What a great year, 2020, for you to uh, set up. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we I think we I think we got authorised February, so you know pretty much immediately into like lockdown one. Uh, feels like about a hundred years ago. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, actually, I was speaking to Jay about this the other day, and uh, you know the great thing about that is I can bore people for the rest of my life about the fact yeah. that I set a business up in a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say exactly yeah. the same. I say I, yeah. I got in, I got into this in um, the credit crunch. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the credit crunch, financial services in the credit, and I'm still here. It's like it's great. Yeah. It is a great story, actually. Yeah, um, it's, but yeah. it's not exactly not exactly a pandemic, though, is it, Sam? You know, it's a, no. just, just, just a, a mere banking crisis. And uh, I, set up, well, I, set, <laughs> I set up the financial plan of life during the pandemic. Did you? All oh, right, okay. Well, you got me there then, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I'm on the page setting up another recruitment company. Well, okay, yeah, yeah, you yeah, you win, you win. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I tell you, what, actually, I joined Chase Devere uh, around about the time of the tech. Uh, bubble collapse. <laughs> so yeah, I did. Yeah, like, <laughs> so it's too much top trumps mania. Yeah, I know it is, isn't it? Yeah, but I was. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't taking business risk at that point. Um, but. But uh, it, it's helpful to, to have been through a few of these. I mean, genuinely, you know, yeah. to, to you, you know, all you get, the more you sort of you, you see you see off these these kind of weird, difficult periods. I do think it's yeah. good because you just you, you get to 
you know you get to set your, set your benchmark appropriately don't you don't you and you kind of you know and you you know what sort of you know what things look like in these sort of slightly distressed circumstances and i think it helps your outlook kind of later on i mean it's a bit like with clients isn't it you know it's like i always i always feel a bit wary of these clients who invest kind of right in the sort of you know in the trough of the market they and they get nothing but growth for like the first sort of you know, five six whatever years um i do worry about you know where that sort of you know how, how that sets them up for the inevitable bear market you're going to get at some point you know because you know i think in a way you know it, you're, you're spoiled as a client in a funny kind of way if you have um, a bit of a rocky time in, in the markets relatively early on because yeah. you see what it looks like you sort of stare it in the face and you come through it you know inevitably with with you know with good advice and um and and you know you always kind of remember that but you'll also kind of always remember that that was temporary and that that you know markets grew through it and stuff and I think it's a little bit the same with business issues isn't it if you've kind of been through a, a tough period but actually everything's kind of worked and you know you've kind of got through it as a team and come out the other side um this is what i'm telling myself anyway <laughs> <laughs> give me another give me another month of like lockdown three and i'll change my mind about all of this and yeah absolutely yeah. Exactly. It's, it's probably just because it's friday as well actually if you'd asked me all of this you yeah. know, yesterday i had a pretty busy like, really, really morose yeah. <laughs> kind of afternoon beers yeah yeah for sure <laughs> um so one of the things i would like to talk to you about that comes up a lot with self-employed when people go employed to self-employed is around restricted covenants Yes. So, you know, people spend a long time in an employed position and build very strong relationships, um, whether they be introducers, whether they be clients, uh, very much they become friends. And, yeah. you know, restricted covenants, non-dealing clause, non-solicitation clause. I mean, we sign ourselves away, don't we, when we're employed? Yeah. So when you move from an employed background, what was your sort of strategy for year one because you've got to pay the bills you've got to bring some client money in yeah you, so, you do yeah you do. what was your you know i'm not asking you here to divulge if you've broken any restricted covenants or anything like that <laughs> but, um, are you, are you, were you wearing a wire no um yeah. I'll, I'll divulge anything but, but something this is something that people are nervous and worried about you know so you know what was your experience about client acquisition within the first year old and new yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, we're always ultra cautious about stuff like that, you know, and it, it, it's just it's just one of those things, isn't there, where, you know, that that sort of stuff can ruin your life. Um, so we've always sort of, you know, trodden very carefully with with all of that, that type of stuff. I was very lucky, actually, because, you know, my um, uh, for, for the actually for the first time in my career um, in the last employed role that I had before this, I, I insisted on um, existing clients being carved out of restrictions. Nice. And, and I would absolutely recommend I mean, I, it's one of those things, you know, you should definitely do if you're an advisor with a client following and some of those will be friends and relatives and stuff and you know and you have the right to take those clients on i i, I think i mean I, I know that employers probably say well you're being you know our budgeting is, is is kind of geared around the fact that you've got a client following i don't really like that approach to employing people anyway i just think why should you come in and be cost neutral straight away as a as an employee but um i guess that's another that's another thing um I, th I th so I so I, th I think I would you know I, I wished I wished I'd done it before because I was put in difficult positions with restrictions like a lot of advisors have been you know where you know you build these really really strong relationships with clients they you know bless them they they, they follow you um, and then they're caught by your general restrictions because you've happened to change employers and everyone knows full well that that you know the relationship primarily is with you and, and clients you know probably see their best chance of continuity with, with you um um but but you know they'll insist on keeping them there for, for that period and it can be an awful awful customer experience i think you know because because mm. often the thing about that is you know i guess in a way if that happens and clients are getting crawled all over us because they want to you know the firm wants to retain their business then it's kind of fair enough because at least they'll be getting some degree of, of service um uh, uh, but but often what happens is they're parked you know there'll, there'll be clients who just get you know the, the firm will be very threatening about about the enforcement of these covenants but clients don't get a phone call for six months or 12 months and I've, I've seen this happen and that's just a really crap position to put somebody in you know not the advisor the, the, the client because they're not getting serviced properly and 
it's potentially there's not the um you know because the advisor might have left their team might have left there might not be the um the the um the ability to to service those clients properly so so i think that's the big issue is actually it's not just between an advisor and a firm the clients get caught up in it and they can have a really crap experience that they never signed up for mm. um and I, I do also think from an advisor's perspective i think a lot of advisors you know, it's it's not a it, it, it's it's not an even sort of contest when it comes to those discussions about covenants. So they'll you know they'll be speaking to a new firm, and you know, of course, at that point, you know, you're eager to say the right things, aren't you? And everybody loves each other when you're in the process of, of joining a firm. So it's a bit like a prenup. You know, it's a sort of row that all back and say, actually, let's talk about what happens if I leave. You know, I know I haven't joined yet, but um, it's not easy to have that conversation. You know, right. it, it's it, you should definitely, and I would say this to advisors who've got a client following, um, absolutely should have that awkward conversation because it's your right to have it. And if a firm has a problem with that, you know, then that's potentially not the right firm to join. Um, it's hard to do, um, but but I think that puts you in a, in a different position then because you don't have that kind of falling in space feeling for six or 12 months where you just don't have any of that income, but you've got clients who yeah. are perfectly happy to pay you that you just can't get hold of yet, yeah. um, uh, But I, which I think is is, is the norm. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm very spoiled really because I didn't have to go through that because no. I was able to, you know, there was an ovation process, clients moved over. So there was a few months, I guess, of getting authorized and set up and getting clients over. So I did have that kind of, you know, income goes from X to, to zero for two, three months. And I guess we had staff costs as well, because I wanted to make sure that there was no sort of gap in income for um, for the rest of the team. So so that got kind of funded along with the setup costs. Um, so it was scary. Um, yeah. Uh, but but the whole time I knew that it wasn't half as scary as it would be if we weren't already in the process of migrating clients and we couldn't even start that for you know, X months. So, um, so yeah, it's an interesting area though, isn't it, Covenants? I mean, it as an is. employer, obviously I've got a slightly different, well, no, I don't have a different view on it, but I can sort of see it from the other side a bit. It's like, it's very difficult to hold, it's very difficult to hold up in court, isn't it? Mm. Uh, a restricted covenant, because you're almost sort of encringing on some, in, in somebody's human rights as to who they can and who they should and shouldn't work with you you know a company will say well there are clients it's like well you don't own the relationship it's the relationship yeah. where the, cl the client has the relationship with who the client wants to have a relationship with now it's not even to say that that individual will actually join the financial advisor who sets up his own or her, her own business anyway because perhaps they like the company that they do business with and it's a bit like you know if someone's at coots for example you know, they love the bank yeah. cards. They love the pen and checkbook. You know, they love yeah. the Coots feel with their mates are at Coots and all that. Now, if yeah. the private banker leaves and sets up another company called, I don't know, Dave's IFA, <laughs> what make, you know, they might have known him for 10 years, but they're like, well, you're not Coots though, Dave, are you? Dave's yeah, IFA. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. You know, I think the thing about restrictions of that sort is that I think it's, it's weak, you know. I think really if you're a confident business, and you're confident that the client buys your business and your brand and your your people um, and their relationship isn't just with one individual, then you don't need covenants, right? Because, no. you know, if a guy walks out the door, they're not going to take their client back because um, there's other stuff worth hanging around for. Um, and I think the fact that advisors are able to do that, I mean, it's mm. testament to probably those advisors and their their relationships with their clients. But but also, I think it's a bit damning in terms of, of the firms themselves. And I think it, it, you know, like you said earlier, you know, the kind of the traditional brands in, in, in financial advice market, particularly bigger ones, why don't they have loyalty? You know, why do advisors leave and take clients with them? You know, that's it's not it's nothing to do with what's in those contractual terms. It's uh, it's to do with you know what 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 they've done or, or haven't done to, to build their brand and yeah. um, convince the client that, that they as an organisation are are the thing that's worth staying with. And and you know I think you know I'm, I'm so as an employer now in a you know firm principle I'm trying so hard not to. Uh, to, to change my mind about things like you said it's you know I, I i like the fact so as we recruit advisors for example you know my, my view right now which is subject to subject to change um <laughs> is um that you know i really don't i don't want to get into that you know i i, I want to make sure that advisors um you know uh, are, are you know they have a right to to continue to look after their clients that, that might happen to follow them if they decide that they, they, they want to do something else and the way i see it, it, it the onus is on us to make those advisors so happy mm. um working within in the structure that we provide for them that they won't even think about leaving and, and, no. and then then the clients aren't that's at flight exactly, risk that's so, exactly right you know without a shadow of a doubt people don't people don't yeah so the motivator for somebody wanting to go off on their own is they like to have their own business. So I think running a business, 
employing people or even taking people on a self-employed basis, you have to make sure that the person that joins culturally fits your business. Mm. So they're, they're a stage of their life where they don't want to think about the marketing side. They don't want to feel, feel like the branding side. All they want to do is align themselves with the right culture and the trust that the employer or the person who runs the business, the owner, has a good head on their shoulders and a good vision that they can buy into and they can think, I can stay here. I feel comfortable and confident. I don't mind if I'm self-employed paying 40% away or 30% away knowing that I'm going to get looked after in multiple areas. So the thought of them leaving anyway becomes less because they're comfortable. And then, and it's a bit like financial planning. If their lifestyle matches their, their job, then there's a good trade-off and a good balance. You know, if you expect someone to be working 12 hour days for a 30 grand basic salary and they're on the phone smashing new business all day, but doing none of the relationship building, they're going to get bored shitless and leave, you know? So Absolutely. culturally yeah. as a business owner, and this is the best thing for you, is just to make sure that when you interview those people and you sit down with them, it's just to really dig deep as to where do they see themselves in the next five to 10 years? Because you'll very easily be able to pick up someone's ambition or sort of um, their, um, uh, what's it called? You know, when they, they might want to set up their own, their entrepreneurial side, you know? Mm. And those people are valuable to your business because they, because you think, God, you know, if I take that person on now, that's a whole different, that guy's got so much drive. He just wants to be part of something, but he doesn't have the confidence right now to set up on his own. Yeah. So bring them in underneath your arm. You could treat them like an individual and an equal. And then all of a sudden you've got a brand new, brand new side of your business and a great partner, not employees. It's how you view those people who come into your practice as well. Absolutely. And um, don't treat them like employees, anybody like employees. They should be, part of your business and that's how i qualify people these days what value add can you bring to my company and where are you going to be in the next five to ten if someone's if i can feel that they're going to scoot out the back door at any opportunity then I'm, it's just not cultural fit it's not a fit for, for me you know yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely and that's good intel and, and you know that that's kind of my view on it i mean you know i, I it, i'd say it wasn't inevitable that i would end up working for myself you know because you know hence why i was i was employed for so long i think you know i was always seeking that that kind of role where you know had that degree of of ability to be entrepreneurial to to be creative in the way that you went about getting your business and stuff like that and i think i think the firm struggled to provide that and i, I want to be different yeah. as a firm um, you know, I, I, I want to, you know, bring people in who've got these great ideas, but but they're, they're not the lone wolf type, you know, they don't want to go and do it on their own. If, if they do, then that's fine. You know, there's there's options for them. But, you know, I'm, I mean, somebody that we're speaking to at the moment, for example, you know, she's very, very, really, really good advisor, very interested in, in getting more into the kind of financial coaching side of thing, which things which you you, you alluded to. Um, you know, it's not something I'm, I, I guess, I, I, I touch on it in aspects of my work, but as a sort of as an area of business, it's not something I'm big on. Um, so my thinking is if, if somebody you know that's an example but if somebody can come in with something like that that they know a lot more about than me and they're, they're, they're much more energized about if, if you can give them uh, enough control over that that area of, of, of the business and you know kind of collaborate on where the, the connections are between that and other areas of the business then um, that could be a really really great hire and, and actually if that person you know is happy to do that within the, the, the structure that, that you've built and, and you make it work for them in terms of of reward and, and job satisfaction, then then that could be a really really great end result for, for everybody. Um, I, mean, I, and think I, I think that's a brilliant idea. I think you taking on a financial coach, if you can bring somebody in who adopts the position of coach, mm. um, financial coach to clients, not only are they not only are they almost taking because they should hopefully be taking on the whole social media side as well. Mm. Um, they are pushing and promoting your brand getting themselves out there and pulling new clients in. If you look at the likes of Claro Money, for example, which is a brand new sort of fintech company, mm. their whole focus is on having coaches, financial mm. coaches. Yeah. And those coaches go out through social media, um, pull people in, and then in those individuals come in via an app, they can do stuff themselves. But when they need financial planning, it gets handed over to a financial planner. Yeah. And there's so much that can be done via the coach um, that is value add as well. Yeah, I knew that the coach, you know, lots of coaches now, um, you know, are doing financial reviews for people. It's not full financial planning and I'm investing all your money. It's just like financial reviews and you can productize that, yeah. you know, and YouTube is a powerful platform for that, you know, because yeah. there's so much that coach can talk about and YouTube's mm -hmm. got such a huge reach and it's, it's, 
in the financial planning space for coaching, it's 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 not that competitive at the moment. You know, I had Peter Comalafe on the website, sorry, on the on the podcast, and his background was um, is coaching. You know, the conversation of money. He's running the podcast. He's running the YouTube channel. All things that you don't have to think about. You know, bring somebody in to do that. I just think it's an absolute winner in an early start, an early stage of a business because it's just marketing as well, isn't it? It's getting yourself out there. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's trying to trying to reclaim that space, I think, where, you know, people are are kind of giving that 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 coaching, I, you know, that, that really should be something that um, advice firms are trying to bring in house and, and link up with the regulated advice side of things. And actually, it's not happening, is it? Not not well, it is, but not, um, not enough, probably. And, you know, you look at the, the real thought leaders out there around money, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's your kind of it's your Twitter guys, isn't it? It's your kind yeah. of, um, you know, it's, it's, personalities. It's, your, it's the yeah. guys with- like a TV personality almost, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, it's somebody out there that can do bite-sized, informative um, yeah. information, but they're comfortable and they, not only that, they enjoy being on camera. Yeah. You know, they enjoy putting yeah. themselves out there. And when you're trying to do the financial planning side of your job and you're thinking, right, I've got to now do the marketing, you don't have enough time in a day. It's as simple as that. And yeah. I'm, I'm realising that in what I do. It's bloody hard, you know? Yeah. It's, it's very, very hard. So... I mean, yeah, it's great. I think it's a great hire, that isn't it? Sounds good. Excellent. Yeah, I, th- I think I think I think it's good. I, I think you know, I, I sort of I, I want to. I don't want to lose that that thing where you know I'm probably still thinking from you know both sides of the fence. Really, I'm sort of, sort of thinking about you know, okay, well, I'm an employer and I want this from from this situation, but but also you know, if I was that employee, I, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to lose that you know because I've I've been you know employee for a long time and I, I've sort of thought. Uh, you know, you see things in a particular way. And sometimes you look at the guys running the businesses and you think, why don't they get that? You know, why don't they, why don't they know how I feel about this? You know, if they just did that little extra thing, then I'd feel so pumped. I'd go and run through walls for that, you know, but they, a lot of these time, a lot of the time these things get kind of missed because of the disconnect. Yeah. Because it's probably because of what you say, you know, they've been employers for a very long time um, and they just think about things in a, in a different way. Um, and I think if you can try and, you know, to, to some degree occupy sort of both both sides in, 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 in your thinking, um, then it should all just join up better, shouldn't it? So um, that's a challenge, I guess. But yeah, 100%. So let's talk about clients and in client acquisition, because it's not all um, novatable clients. It's very nice if you can novate some clients. When you <laughs> yeah. but a big part yeah, of it also is, is new business. And you get the opportunity, as you alluded to in the beginning of this call, to start targeting um, specific niches of clients that you wouldn't normally target. So could you give an example of the typical uh, or some of the more abstract clients that you're now giving financial advice to? Uh, yeah, for, for sure. I, th- I think, I mean, sort of in terms of, I, th- I think, underserved bits of, of the market. I mean, there's, there's a few, you know, and I, I think they sort of do the rounds. I think like, you know, people who own businesses tend to not, not get involved with financial advisors until potentially quite late in the process. And we've got some, you know, some good clients who are owner managers and they're good referrers. Um, and we, we do great work for them. Um, I think I think the other area, which I think is potentially sort of um, talked about less is, is you kind of fire um, bit of the market, you know, your financial independence guys. So, you know, who would tend to be younger um, and not, in, you know, in some ways you, you wouldn't think of them as being sort of natural kind of um, um, seekers of, of financial advice because, you know, it's almost like this this sense. And I think there's certainly a sense in the advice industry that these guys are, are kind of uh, against the advice function because they're just trying to strip out all of the costs that they possibly can and, you know, of, of products of advice and where a cost. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, they, 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 and they want to get all of their advice on TikTok or, or, you know, Instagram or wherever, but, but I, I don't think that's true. And, you know, I'm, I'll, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sure enough, uh, that, that it's not true that I think that, I think there's a market out there for, um, for clients who, who are in that mindset, who are, you know, who are thinking in those sorts of terms, but actually need, and, and I think know that, that they need, although they might not sort of have articulated it to themselves in that way. Um, uh, an advisor of, of some description, you know, might look like a coach, it might look like a traditional IFA financial planner type. Um, but I think there's an awful lot of connectivity between the way that, that your fire investors uh, are looking to, 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 to see things pan out and what a financial planner, good financial planner is able to bring to things. Um, so, so that's an area of the market that, you know, I've just struggled to fit clients like that into a proposition at other places. Um, and, and since, you know, we've, we've been on our own, We've been speaking to guys like that a lot more through, you know, perhaps channels we wouldn't have before, like social media. Mm. Um, 
and and it's working well. You know, we're we're, we're taking on some really really interesting clients who who have um you know who have that that outlook on things, um and and it's and it's a good fit, um and I think the rest of the industry or you know not all of it but I think most of it is is missing a trick there because they're seeing, you know, this kind of movement as as being an anti advice movement, and I don't think it is. Yeah, it's just about yeah trying to look for you know how you can help in slightly different ways and market yourself differently. Absolutely. So don't look at them as almost like um, the you know the uh, yeah you hear the term the DIY brigade. Yeah. You know, here yeah. come the DIY brigade. You know they're learning all their stuff from a YouTube video or yeah. um, the Reddit groups that are kind of taking down Wall Street. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love like, those oh, guys. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> all that, all that. <laughs> what do you what do you think of that? It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I just said earlier, I just I think it's 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 very it worries me a bit actually. You know, I think it's it's, it's all it's, it's box office, isn't it? I mean, who you know who wouldn't love a bunch of guys on Reddit? You know, taking down some hedge fund guys. Um, okay, what I worry about is you know I I, I think there's this sort of um, you know this this slightly lazy view that young people aren't engaged with money and they're not very interested in in you know in. in in, in the, the world world of investment and they don't have the wealth to, to do anything if, if they were. I don't think any of those things are true. I think there's a lot of money cascading down the generations. Um, uh, and I think, you know, and it's happening already and it's going to happen more. And I also think that a lot of these guys are actually potentially very interested in engaging with, with the world of, of, of finance, which is is what we've seen, right, you know, with all these um, uh, the, these Reddit investors and, and what's going on now. And, and, and before that, you know, I know it's, it's, it's related, but, but, you know, all of this, this, um, this massive volume of, of, of trading in small accounts on on Robin Hood. Um, and I think I think the thing about that is, is it sort of proves to me that, that there are guys there that want to get their money into the markets and they're interested in how that can work for them. Um, you know, how, however, I, I think they're, they're looking in the wrong places. And, and I think stuff like, you know, this 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 all this this GameStop uh, stuff and, and Robin Hood, it, it concerns me that, that you've got relatively inexperienced in, investors you know, uh, getting into the industry in this really kind of gamified way where it's really, really super easy to take out these really complex positions in, you know, in, in, in derivatives um, you, you know, using Robin Hood. And actually, you know, it's, it's great that they're engaged and it's great that they're, they're, they're having this, this sort of, in, you know, that, that level of interest generated. But, you know, I think, I think a lot of people are going to get into positions that, that, um, that they're going to regret. Um, and I think there'll be tears before bedtime, you know, over all that stuff. And, and I think the danger there is it just puts a load of people off just engagement with the world of investing full stop. Um, so, you know, I, th I think I would like to see happen more is, is guys like that speak to, speak to experts, right? You know, and I, I think that the, the, the challenge there is, is the experts being able to speak to them the right way in, in a way that appeals as much as Robin Hood does or, you know, what some guy on Reddit says or some guy on Twitter. I think if you've got, you know, people in the advice sector speaking to, to that community in a way that, that makes sense to them the same way, I think there's some great clients out there and, and some great work that can be done for those clients. But it's a challenge, you know, to, 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 to communicate the right way, I think. Communicate and engage in the right way. Perhaps Reddit then, because, you know, mm. I never hear of any financial planners that actually engage on Reddit or get involved in it at all. But obviously it's a platform that that sparks huge communication, doesn't it? And that's the thing. And, and, and also tribes, you know, there's a very tribal mentality on the likes of Reddit, isn't it? You yeah. know, it's, a, it's like a public forum in individual communities. And um, whereas communities usually are quite, usually you have to go into a community and it's locked off and blocked off from anybody else and you're part of it but these are like open public communities so someone who's sort of stroke you know typing in some you know how to how to invest or i'd like to take down wall street or whatever can find those <laughs> find that yeah. information so easily and i just wonder whether or not enough financial planners are using the actual platform reddit and how powerful reddit could actually be to educate clients around money but also to generate the next the next client or influence the next generation that are receiving the higher lump sums as the money passes down the family yeah I, I, absolutely i mean this is this is where my this is my, my age which which you've already established is is advanced becomes an issue because 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 you know I, I don't use reddit you know i mean i'm, I'm sort of semi uh au fait with with social media but but you know i mean I don't know how many People use Facebook these days, none probably. So um, you know, I, I, I guess I'm already starting to feel like, uh, you know, can I can I really talk to, to people at that level? I think that's why you know, recruitment is so important. 
getting people in who are you know who think more like that i mean i, I feel like i'm just about i'm sort of a, a kind of a, at an age where i can just about relate to people at kind of either end of the age spectrum that, that i deal with and that's mm. uh, and that, that, that's good but um but but no i i think you know I, I, absolutely i mean guys who are kind of in those communities you know who, who are looking at becoming advisors and, and kind of and, and being a voice of the advisor within those communities where they they, they have credibility would be a great thing I, I i think and and i think it's 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 an issue when you think about the average age of, age of advisors isn't it because mm. um you know what what kind of um media are, are typical advisors using to speak to people it's probably generally not the, the sort of media that, that those types of clients are going to be looking at you know and um, i mean in my in my very limited way you know i sort of try and speak about some of these issues and um you know a client that we took on um you know look newish client you know lovely, lovely guys fire investors we we took them on through through twitter so it was essentially a twitter acquisition um and you know and, and we when we started speaking to them initially you know it was all about this kind of fire approach and, and they, they and they pretty much said you know you're the only person vaguely related to the world of advice and you know regulated advice that that's that's talking about about fire anywhere and, right. I, and i'm not i'm not prolific right you know it's not like I'm, I'm an expert it's not like i'm out there talking about it every five minutes um but i i just I just talked about it a bit and you know there was a link back to something on our website where we've where we've talked about it and i guess they got a sense that we we got it and you know and, and that was the start of a conversation and, and that and that's where we went but you know i, I think of those guys i mean uh, it, it's, it's it's kind of mind-boggling isn't it in a way that you know in the whole of the twitter sphere they um you know they, they just they narrowed their search down to essentially one person <laughs> at one firm who wasn't even trying all that hard to market themselves as there somebody that, that's an that, expert in that. So um, that to me says that there is a niche that does require mm. financial planning. Mm. What's then needed is lines of communication to be opened, evidence that somebody within the fire community has benefited from financial planning, which they have, which is that testimonial. Yeah. Um, my, my advice to you would be around this is to raise your profile by connecting with influencers within the fire space. Mm. and you probably find five to ten of them are out there right with huge followings huge followings and all these people they're following are then going to engage with any bit of content that you jewel up with with them so if you jumped on some fire podcasts and you mm. talked about financial planning for those that are seeking fire you know financial independence retire early and the power of how to partner with a financial planner in the right way I mean, that would add so much value and there's so much that you can give because you're an expert within financial planning and they're not. And I mm. think by, by just doing a quick search as to who these main influencers are, you will find that they will happily get you on their podcast. They will happily interview you on YouTube. They'll happily do some stuff on, on blog articles because A, it raises their profile a little bit. It's something interesting for them to talk about. Mm. Um, but then you are actually adding good, especially if you bring along the guy or girl that you have already um, provided a service to who can act as a testimonial. So that there is a prime example of a super niche within the next gen within yeah. financial planning that require and, and and that's an ex that is like that's an excellent opportunity to raise your profile yeah it's, it's, it's a good shout absolutely you know it's all about just getting that conversation going isn't it and then it if is. you end up you know i'm sure there are people in the fire community who are violently anti-advisor and anti-traditional advice and that's great you know let's let's have at it you know let's talk about um you know what what, what the issues are or perceived issues and um, I, th I think that would be a great a great debate to, to have because it's probably not really happening is it because probably right. you've got advisors just assuming that, that that you know fire guys aren't really interested in advice and you know maybe those fire guys assuming that the traditional advice industry isn't for them because they don't look like the right fit um but you know we've got real living breathing clients that are actually you know seeing the link between the two and kind of educating us on yeah. on where they see they see the value i always think it's you know it, it sounds like an obvious thing but like listening to real people because you know so much gets decided on behalf of uh, uh of clients doesn't it and yeah. you know I, I'm, i've been doing a, an industry event couple of years ago and you know somebody was telling me about you know it was robo advice you know it's like why young why you know some old guy why why young people don't want to have face-to-face -face meetings anymore and they don't want to speak to real people yeah. and actually they just want it all in an app but it's rubbish you know it's complete rubbish because i you know i, I told her I, I got you know the clients are probably skewed a bit younger than average anyway for whatever reason and um speaking to, to you know some guy i look after and he was like 
it's crap. I mean, he said, I, you know, I don't, I don't think like that. I'm a young person. And, you know, why, why, why would I want to change, you know, the outlook that humans have had for like, you know, the whole yeah. evolution, you know, they, they want to, they want to interact with people, don't they? They want to take their advice from actual people. Why, why would I want to do it differently? And, it's you know, just because some guy at a conference says I do. Yeah. It's fear mongering, you know, yeah. it's, it's stirred up by the tech companies, but it's also fear from the communities that probably don't embrace technology or understand the value of it technology is always going to it's going to be there and it's going to increase and the idea is that it's there to improve interaction the very fact that i'm sat here on a you know at my desk you're at yours we're chatting away to each other we chose face to face we can see each other it it, it doesn't that <laughs> but before i was doing any video stuff it was telephone and you know you not being able to physically see somebody was, was like it's actually not it's quite hard and it's quite lonely so yeah. why would you remove the need to see somebody <laughs> yeah what you're just trying to do is is make it more efficient so if i can sit down and see 10 people in in my day yeah. that's amazing because i've had 10 interactions that i would never have got if i had to get in my car and drive around the country it'd have taken me a week yeah. you know so it's like embrace it face to face is there we are naturally social creatures we have to socialize otherwise we get depressed you know it's, it's what we're about is how we learn off of each other and um I, I think the more you get out there and the more you speak to people the more conversations you have the better and that's i like do me one favor greg just do that make a list of five five sort of influences within that space and just reach out to them because it's very it's a very small task you have to do but i bet you you get some amazing amazing stuff off the back of it and you meet some brilliant people and your your mind expands you might not get something instantly but i bet you get some stuff a bit further down the line but also it gives you that experience a bit like this podcast of putting yourself out there and sharing your opinion unapologetically and you're yeah. sharing that authentic true self which only helps you grow as a person and gets you out there more i can say that because i'm 32 episodes into this podcast never did it before but my god am i out there now and i'm speaking to so many different people i've got so many people around me that are helping me that i never had before you know it's just and it adds value in so many different ways and you i don't know it just makes you feel good as well i think yeah. you start to help other people as well it's, it's brilliant it's a great it's a great thing you're doing you're doing a great thing like, like you said you know i think the the advice kind of community i think needs some some, some help you know so in terms of sharing best practice and having that community feel especially at the moment you know where you just can't get to events and see people um you know i think i think stuff like this is great because you just i mean i you know listen to your other podcast I did really um and you can um you know you just you just hear a lot of stuff you know the, the from, from other places you know and, and the thing the thing about it is a lot of it's happening in these small firms isn't it so you know it's, it's kind of relatively easy to find out what SJP or wherever thinks about you know x or, or y because it's 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 out there in you know the public domain but but um and, and you've probably read about it in, in the industry press but you know all, so much good stuff is, is happening in these small firms in the advice industry and it's it quite hard for them to hear from other small firms because actually particularly at the moment how do you do that so i think stuff like this is is, is great and i think it's good to be challenged as well i mean you, you mentioned in some ways it's terrifying you know going speaking to, to to five people who um you know potentially have a view that that kind of um that is is opposed to yours and, and there's a there's a sharing of ideas to happen um it's kind of scary but i quite like to be challenged on stuff like that you know it's 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 healthy isn't it you know i mean i i i, 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 yeah. I mean again you know may, i mean may Perhaps I'm, I'm sort of, you know, a bit like with the employee employer thing. I think my view on, you know, client acquisition is always, I always think it's, it's kind of healthily balanced in terms of, you know, not everyone needs a financial advisor, you know, not everyone, some, you know, and, and restricted advisors aren't evil and, you know, actually big, you know, it, 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 there's, there, there are a lot of different ways to, to cater for people's needs. in 100%. this. 100%. There's value add everywhere. Don't look for the, don't look, look for the similarities. Don't look for the, you know, too hard yeah. the, the, the differences. Absolutely. And if you're looking at differences and then look at the solutions of how you can add value, because yeah. all people want to do is learn from each other. You know, I, so I love speaking to financial planners because I learn so much personally, but also from yeah. a business perspective and, yeah. um, you know, from my own personal branding and marketing, you know, I'm building a community soon around financial planner life. I'd never have done that if I wasn't speaking to that many financial planners and opening up lines of communication. And the one thing that I've definitely picked up is that there is an appetite for financial planners to talk to each other. And you hit the nail on the head, right? financial planning over the next five to ten years and now really is in the early stage of startup you know it may feel like it's traditional been there forever and there's a lot of large firms that have but there's a huge amount of small firms that are in startup stage 
So this is an exciting time to become a financial planner. Great yeah. technology. You've got marketing. You've got branding. No one's been doing it before. Coaches are coming out. I mean, this is an exciting time, exciting period for financial planning. And, um, you know, people just need to get behind it. And also outside of the profession, you need to be looking at it and going, there's a shitload of money to be made in financial planning. I know you shouldn't say that. Oh, we should be motivated by money. There is a shitload of money to be made in financial planning. As a career, you can earn good money. You can build a really great business that has a good level of recurring income that when you end up selling it, you can make a really nice exit. You know, we're all here to do one thing, whether it's build a pension pot that pays our retirement or build a business that pays our retirement. And financial planning as a career is very interesting, very engaging and very rewarding, but it pays well and you can build uh, long term value. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. No, I, I agree with that. I think that, you know, I'm very heartened about, you know, some of the, the young guys I speak to who are, who are, you know, in the process of joining the the, the, the industry or, or deciding whether to. I just think um you know, it, it's it's um, there's a big there's a big advice gap, you know, and I think you know you look at that just just from the outside. I mean, there's huge huge opportunity for 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 people to get into the industry really really disruptive because it's ripe for disruption, um, overly so. You know, I, I don't know how it's got away with it for so long really as a as a as a sector, you know, um, uh, and I, I think you know smart ambitious guys kind of getting in um can can really you know I, I think carve out a really interesting kind of niche for themselves in in, in the market because there's, there's a lot to go at um and i think the other thing that's really good about about the industry and my sort of pitch to people who are you know thinking about whether to, to join it i do some some mentoring through the the pfs scheme which is actually really good and i'd, I'd recommend it for mentors and ment mentees um uh, like you know you speak to some of these really young smart guys who are you know e either they're in the industry or they're at university and they're, they're considering um uh, it, it, it as a career um and a lot of them are they're, they're really interested in doing you know what i didn't do and just kind of getting straight into self-employment and just getting into these kind of entrepreneurial spaces very early on and, and those guys really really excite me because you know I, I think there's probably so much good stuff and good knowledge that that's going to be coming in through through people like that that are just going to just going to dive in and you know probably make everyone realize that that stuff that's just been taken for granted has been done wrong for you know the last hundred years and, and we're all going to find out how, how to do it better and differently and then we'll be copying them and i think that's that's, that's progress you know yeah, I love um that. so i think this yeah no I, I agree you know i feel very positive about you know going it's back refreshing to and positive look at the future of financial planning not the doom and gloom that sometimes gets talked about so much there is actually positive things happening so amazing yeah. talent coming in and as you said is that through like next gen planners that you do that mentoring uh, no i'm no it's, it's not so it's the pfs is kind of a, a sort of official thing we have a portal for it um, but i'm aware of next gen planners as well and that, that that's really good and i should i should yeah. get involved with that 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 too in fact there's this there's, there's, there's a bit of crossover actually some of the people i speak to through that also are involved with next gen so um, adam owens isn't it that's right yeah yeah well, i spoke to adam a couple of times um so we're in the process of doing something together around building community for financial planner life so you know i'm going to be looking for for, for, for mentors, really, people that can add value and, you know, almost create an incubator for startup. So yeah. here we are. This is financial planning. This is what can be done. Get some brilliant people in there, some great, you know, I'm also looking at people that are outside the profession. So bringing in like LinkedIn experts that aren't mm. in financial planning, bringing in marketing experts that aren't in financial planning to be able to give that expertise from an outside perspective, instead of it always having to be this insular kind of you know, I'm a financial planner who's turned into a marketer and I'll tell you how to be a marketer because I understand financial planning. It's like, well, no, yeah. you know, you need people who don't, who can challenge the shit out of you. Yeah. So I want to build this kind of community of people that kind of, and I need people in it. So um, I'll be reaching out to my guests and, and all that kind of stuff to really get this going because I think there's an appetite. When you said startup and what I love, and so I say something, I said to you, I learn on of, of, every, of every call that I make, right? And when you, when we, we've got onto the subject about startup, that to me is, we are in a startup phase within financial planning. You know, why, yeah. can't, why can't we say that? That's a great thing. And, the, and I've never heard the term disruptive in financial planning. And like, yeah. that's, it can be disruptive. Something can come along and be disruptive and just knock St. James's place off their pedestal. Yeah. You know, this academies that they're all doing, which are, you know, brilliant stuff for the, for, for the profession, but it has to, you know, that can't be the only bloody way for people to get into this profession, you know? There's yeah. some bloody cre clever clever guys out there and girls, you know? They just need to they just need to know how to do it and, and perhaps bounce off a few people that have been there and done it and got the t-shirt. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you know, and I think I think that's the thing that, that that's the challenge, you know, if you're a guy who, who, you know, a girl who wants to kind of get into the industry and kind of do it your own way at an early stage, which I think is is a, is a potential sort of route in now and, and something that's interesting to people. Um, you kind of you, I guess what, what you're doing is you're bypassing the sort of thing that I benefited from. You know, you join a big firm and you sat next to some guy who's listening to your calls and telling you that you've got, you know, you got the ISA allowance wrong or whatever so you know arguably you miss you miss some of the basics along the way and, and you know I think um if there's you know community if there's if there's a sort of exchange of knowledge with, with guys who are experienced practitioners and they've been around for a long time um helping those guys up I, I think that's that, that's that's got to be a good thing isn't it because I tell you what you know okay. I think there's a lot of you know there's a lot of firms out there and I think there's a lot of people who probably think like me that, that you know they've, they've been knocking around the industry for a long time um, you know, they really, really want to see the advice gap closed uh, to, to a greater degree and they want to see good guys come in and they want to find out what they don't know so that they can sort of evolve things and not get too sort of stuck in, in established ways of doing things. And, um, um, you know, I'd, I'd really, you know, I'd love the opportunity to sort of, you know, help help drag some kind of guys up and get some good well, you new wanna, firms up and running. As well as a business owner, you, you know, you, you've, you've got a job to do, right? You've got to do your job. There's only so much time in the day, right? So you can't go helping everyone all day long. I always never make any money. But if there's something that you're, if you can turn around to say someone who's just got their level four qualification off their own back, say, come and, come and work with me, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've got is this community you can bolt straight into. So if you want to learn a bit about marketing, if you want to learn a bit about this, a little bit about that, and perhaps do some training around this and whatever it might well be, it's all in the community. And we, we're a member. So I'll pop you in the community. You can do loads of your learning there um yeah. you know cpds are in there all that kind of stuff as well but at the same time i'll give you on the job work um we've got our you know we've got our community manager um uh, and we've got our financial coach they're out there doing the marketing branding making sure our social presence is really good so we're getting lots of people coming through that you can talk to so you can cut your teeth on some of those some of them will want advice some of them won't but guess what that's going to help you out and get you talking to people i mean that's a great model really i yeah. think um yeah i think i think Definitely think about leading with that social and community focus um, because um, not enough financial planning firms do that. Um, and um, I don't know, it'll definitely set you apart. 11.2, you know, that's the future. That's the future of financial planning. Here, Greg. Uh, I absolutely. Mean, you've, you've, said, you've said it now, so that it must be right. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely, <laughs> well, we, definitely we think. for a non-executive director role here. Absolutely, bring it on. Yeah, yeah. Well, you yeah, you've said it, and that's two of us. So we we, we must we we must be right because we both agree on it. So uh, now that sounds that sounds that sounds great. You know, it's a uh, sort of exciting time. Funny way, you know, it's a funny time to have started up. Um, you know, what with uh, all the other other stuff going on, but really exciting time as well because you know I'm sort of just looking outside um, the, the the firm of what's going on generally, and it's it's all good stuff. You know, so uh, yeah, onward and upward. I agree. Greg, listen, really appreciate your time today. I think we've had a really good conversation, um, you know, and lots have come off of it for myself. Um, and um, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Thanks for sharing some of your thoughts. And um, yeah, have a have a fantastic weekend, mate. Thanks a lot, mate. Yeah, you too. Cheers, Greg. Pleasure. Cheers.